Hi, I'm Joy Smith from AHEAD, um, and we're here to talk about Social Security benefits and working. Uh, so thank you for attending. Um, we're going to go over a lot of information here tonight, but this is still a general um, overview of Social Security benefits. These benefits can be somewhat overwhelming, somewhat confusing, but rest assured there are individuals who can help you through this process. Um, I'm what's known as a CWIC, that the acronym is CWIC, as you see on the screen there, and that stands for Community Work Incentive Coordinator. So basically, I'm trained by the Social Security Administration to provide you with information related to Social Security benefits and working. We conduct outreach presentations like this, but we also do one-on-one -on -one counseling um, for Social Security beneficiaries where we go over their unique situation and basically go through what benefits they have and how working is going to affect those benefits, if it's going to affect the benefits, how to report earnings, how to uh, correspond with the Social Security Administration, the County Assistance Office, um, to make sure that it's a smooth transition. Uh, so we are, are here to help. We're going to talk a little bit about the Social Security benefits, and then we're also going to talk about how to make referrals uh, for this service, which is which is super helpful for a lot of families. Just a little bit of background about me. Um, I've been a benefits counselor of CWIC uh, since 2001. Uh, so AHEAD has had this grant since then from the Social Security Administration um, and since that, the beginning of 2001, we've been providing this service. Um, we'll go through in a little bit how the territories are broken up, um, but AHEAD covers most of Western Pennsylvania and even into Central Pennsylvania through our Social Security grant. There's my email and phone number. Email is generally the best way to reach me. So just a little bit about AHEAD's mission. Um, AHEAD has been around since 1972. We started as a support and employment agency, helping people with disabilities uh, find jobs and job coaching them. Um, we still do that. Uh, that's a large portion of our business, but we also do have the benefits counseling. Um, we have benefits counseling through a, a three or four different uh, funding sources right now, um, but this, it's, key for individuals who are looking to go to work or already working to understand how their benefits are affected. It's best to have this done before the work starts. We'll still work with people after they've already been working, but it's best to have this information from the beginning. Um, you know, our, our vision is to be the premier agent for creating innovative pathways to employment and, in, you know, greater independence for people with disabilities. Since I started doing this way back in 2001, we wanted to try to change the goal because so many people call us and or email us, reach out to us and say, I wanna to go to work, but I don't want to lose my benefits. Or I can only work 20 hours because uh, someone told me that and I don't wanna lose my benefits. And those are all valid concerns. And we do discuss that with individuals, but really what we wanna do is to encourage people to work to be better off financially. That's key. I mean, that's why most people work. <laughs> you need to work to pay the bills, but we also want to work because, um, it, you know, it, you learn new skills, you're out with people, um, you're, you're providing something back to uh, society. And with all the great things that are going on with transition, you know, it just makes sense for the, for the students to get out of school and then go to work. You don't want them to be uh, at home. That doesn't mean they have to lose their benefits. That, and they may not. I've been working with some people for all this time and they're still getting some social security benefits or some medical assistance. Everyone's situation is different. And you know, the, the goal from benefits counseling was never to say, well, you know, we gotta encourage people to get off of their social security benefits. That's not what social security wanted. Um, when I first started doing this, sometimes people would be like, oh, that's the lady who's going to take away my benefits. And that, that was never the goal. The goal was to encourage people to do what they can. If that means working off benefits, great. 
If that means working 10 hours a week, that's what, that's what you're doing. So it's really kind of changing some of the philosophy. So it, it, this is, I keep this on here. This is more for professionals, but I, I kind of think that this is when you should be thinking about benefits counseling and what needs to happen. If any of these things are, are popping up in your mind, because a lot of times people think, well, I know enough about the benefits. I don't need the counseling. And you might know a piece of it, but you need to know the whole picture. Um, you know, I worked in the past and my benefits were messed up. Uh, a lot of times people have a bad situation and maybe they didn't report their earnings and now they're in a, pro they're having a problem. So whenever you go to work, we want this to be positive. So the more information we can give you in the beginning, it's great. Um, you know, we talk to a lot of people and they want to work, but maybe their family's worried about it or their representative payee is saying, no, it's probably not a good idea to work. Um, health insurance. I mean, all of us need our health insurance, right? Um, that's critical. I talk to a lot of families and the families will say, I'm not so much worried about the cash benefits, but we can't lose this medical assistance because he's on waiver. Um, you know, he goes to the doctor a lot, prescriptions, all this kind of stuff. So that's, that's key as well. Um, the next to the last bullet here, I mean, as you go through the process, if you're not already on Social Security benefits, but you're applying, you know, it's a lot of paperwork. I mean, they ask you a million and one questions. And, you know, once you finally get through all that and you get the letter saying you're eligible for benefits, you kind of like take a step back and think, well, I don't want to mess this up because of all the work I had to do. Um, you know, and the last bullet point there is, uh, you know, we want to work. It's a good thing to work, but you know, this is the person's first job. Wonder if it doesn't work out. What's going to happen to that person? What's going to happen to their benefits? These are all things that we talk about through benefits counseling. Social security at the federal level and even at the local level, you might not hear it, but even at the local level, they realize that there's barriers that they've created towards employment. I mean, it, it, there's, they're right in there. They realize that. Fear, you know, this, it, it's overwhelming. You know, any letters that you get from it, whether it be the IRS or um, Social Security or something along like that, the, the Department of the Treasury, you get a little fearful when you open the letter. It's like, uh oh, what did I do wrong here? You know, it, it's, it's, it, it causes anxiety. Like I said, it's tough to qualify for these benefits, you know, and you got to show them a ton of information, not only medical, but financial. Uh, they ask you a lot of questions. Unfortunately, there's a lot of wrong or partial information out there. And that can come from friends, family, that can come from schools, that can come from, you know, their support personnel who job coaching services. There's a lot. Of, I just heard two cases this week where Support staff gave individuals completely wrong information. Um, you know, I, I really, and I said this to my staff, I like, I really wish if you don't know it 100%, don't say anything, because that would be, that would be better than the, the support staff from another agency saying something. And then months later, benefit through benefits counseling, we find out it's a completely different situation. So unfortunately, there's always going to be wrong or partial information out there. One of the biggest ones, and this is, has been prevalent since day one, the thought of I can work part-time and still keep my benefits. That statement has never been true and will never be true. It's just, I mean, it's, or if I work minimally, I mean, that's a subjective term. Spoke with a gentleman last week. He was given information. Well, I don't work that much. Everyone says I work a minimal amount. Why is all this happening? Well, because your minimal is different than, you know, what uh, the state and the federal government feel is minimal. This is complex information. I mean, there's a ton of regulations you have to follow, um, especially if you have uh, several benefits. You know, if you're on SSI, if you get food stamps, SNAP benefits, if you get subsidized housing, if you get waiver. I mean, all of those benefits you get for different reasons and they're used for different things. So it stands to reason that whenever you go to work, each one of them are affected differently. 
So you got to kind of go down a path for each one of those benefits to figure out what's going on. Uh, the last bullet point there is overpayment. Um, an overpayment is basically when Social Security has paid a beneficiary too much money. And when Social Security figures that out, they want that money back. Overpayments can be minimal, about $100, $200. They can go into the thousands and thousands of dollars. I've had overpayments that are twenty and thirty, forty thousand dollars. Um, that's not uncommon. Social Security is making great efforts to try to minimize overpayments, but I don't think in some situations we'll ever eliminate them. But the minimization is is the better route. Um, when I first started years ago, it was eighty, ninety, or a hundred thousand dollars in overpayments, and we'll talk a little bit about how that can happen and how that can grow that high. We're gonna talk about the two different programs that Social Security offers for an individual with a disability. The first one is Social Security Disability Insurance. That's considered a Title II program. Basically, it is pu publicly funded long-term disability. So as we work and pay into the system, we're paying into that fund. If something were to happen to me and I became disabled, I've paid enough in, I would, if I medically qualified for social security benefits, I could get SSDI. Now, if I was on the other, you know, in another variation of that, let's say I didn't work enough. I stayed home with the kids and I didn't pay enough in. If I became disabled, I would not get SSDI. Someone has to pay in to the SSDI funding stream to be eligible for this. There are, uh, they, they calculate the payments based on your work history. So the more you pay in, the more you make, the more you could get on SSDI. If you just paid in the bare minimum, you would get a, a, a minimal check each month. The average, I mean, the average SSDI benefit now is probably is around $1,000 a month, maybe $1,100. Okay, but I've had some individuals get $200 a month and I've had some get $2,000 a month. It all is, is based on how much you paid when you worked. SSDI is, is a very um, specific program and you have to have paid enough in. And it's a very black and white issue. You either pay enough or you don't. Um, there's also a five month waiting period for cash benefits. So if I became eligible for SSDI today, I got to wait five months until I get my first check. N no, uh, <laughs> no wiggle room on that. Then there is a two year waiting period for Medicare. So I'm not really of Medicare age because we think of individuals who are retirees that would get Medicare. But using myself as an example, if I became eligible for SSDI this year, I would be eligible for Medicare two years from now. It's the same Medicare retirees have. It's just I'm eligible for it under the SSDI rules. One thing you might want to think about, especially for transition age kids, is children of a person that has paid enough into SSDI can also claim off of that parent's record. So let's say, for example, I'm collecting SSDI because I have a disability. Then my son, if he has a disability, he could claim off of my record also. As parents, if you're not disabled right now or not collecting retirement benefits, then your child cannot collect off of your SSDI. But as you go, you know, become older, and let's say you hit full retirement age, your son or daughter may be, you know, in their 30s or 40s, they could collect off of your SSDI. It's what's known as a disabled adult child. So you've paid enough into the system. And then that child, because they have a long term disability, they can claim off of your work record. 
The other stipulation with that is the child has to be diagnosed with a disability before the age of 22. So if that happens, whenever you or their, their other parent would go and collect Social Security retirement benefits, they ask you questions. Do you have any dependent children? And you would answer yes. And then that child could receive SSDI off of your work record. Um, while you're living, they get approximately 50% of your benefit amount. It doesn't change what you're eligible for. If you're eligible for $2,000, you're still going to get your $2,000 a month, but your son or daughter would get approximately $1,000 a month. If your son or daughter is still on SSDI whenever you pass away, they then can claim 75% of your uh, cash benefit. I've had some, in, uh, some folks that claim off of their parents' record for many, many years. So whenever you're on SSDI and you, and you want to go to work, you have to think about a couple different terms here. One of them is a trial work period. Trial work period is basically where Social Security says to you, go to work, make as much money as you want to, and nothing happens to your SSDI cash benefit. Couple things to think about with the trial work period. You only get one the entire time you're on Social Security disability. So if you use that up this year, that's gonna be on your record. I've had some folks that used it up 10 years ago. They don't get another one, even though they've had six different jobs since then, you get one. The other um, uh, part of this is you have to earn a certain amount of money for this to even kick in. So for this year, you have to earn $1,050 gross per month. So if you're going to work, you're on SSDI and you're making $900 gross per month, you're not starting this trial work period. Let's say you do that for a few months and things are going good, you increase your rate of pay or your hours, and now you're making $1,100 a month. That's going to start this nine-month trial work period. You have nine of those months to test it out and see how you do. Um, notice I didn't say how many hours or how much you made per hour, because Social Security only looks at gross earnings per month. They don't care if you work 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week, make $9 or $20, it's how much have you earned in the month. That's why I was saying that 20 hour a week rule doesn't apply because 20 hours at minimum wage or a little bit above is very different than 20 hours a week at you know, 18, 19 dollars an hour. And we're seeing right now most hourly wages are higher than they were, you know, a few years ago. So you have this nine month trial work period and a lot of people will get really worried about it. It's like, oh my goodness, what does this mean? It means you used it, but the next step of this whole process is something called the extended period of eligibility. So that nine months ends, but then you go into this extension. And during that extension, if you're earning over substantial gainful activity, that's a key word here, substantial gainful activity, then you're not gonna get your SSDI benefit. But if for any reason you go below a, a substantial gainful activity, you get your check back for that month. So during this extended period, you can go back up and down as many times as you want to, doesn't matter. But if you go over the S SGA amount, you don't get your check. SSDI is an all or nothing program. So you either get your full check or it goes down to zero. The substantial gainful activity per month for this year is $1,470 gross per month. So that's the amount that Social Security is saying to you, if you can go and earn that much or more per month, you're no longer eligible for your SSDI benefit. Could you repeat that, Joy, what the amount was? 
So the amount is $1,470 gross per month. The SGA amount and the trial work period amount I just gave you changes every January when the cost of living is adjusted. So in January, those amounts amount will go up. I'm assuming cost of living is going to go up because of because <laughs> of what we know is going on. But um, it and they have consistently gone up for the past ten or so years. So it does allow you to earn more money, but you have to be cautious of that because after that trial work period is over, then if you're above that amount, it's all or nothing. They are going to stop the check. But at the same time, like I mentioned, I have had people that use their trial work period up 10 years ago. They're still getting an SSDI benefit because their earnings are below that substantial gainful activity amount. A lot of people ask me, well, you know, if you get close to that, does Social Security start to look to see what's going on? Um, they kind of do. Um, the, the way they do that is through something called a work review. And they do this on everyone who's working on Social Security benefits. They're just checking on the status to see, okay, hey, Joy, we see you've been working at Burger King for 10 years now. You're still working here. What's going on? And, and you want to tell them information about your job, how, how you're doing. But what I also tell individuals, you have to let Social Security know what support you're getting as well, okay? Because you're re eligible for SSDI because of a disability status. So if you, and you might be doing really well at Burger King, okay? But what does it take for you to do really well there? Do you have some supports at home that are helping you, you know, help you make sure your clothes are clean for work? Do you make sure, you know, someone get you get up on time? I mean, everyone's situation and, and, and levels are different, but you really want to be overly uh, explicit with Social Security on what it takes for you to go to work. Um, I was I was talking to a mom the other day about this, and she's just like, well, you know, those are just things we do as mom and dad. And I said, I get that. But if you don't tell Social Security that you're helping your 27 year old son make sure his clothes are clean and ha packs a lunch and you go to the store and buy the stuff for the lunch and all that, they're going to think he's doing it all on his own. So you really want to key in when anytime Social Security is questioning the work, and they will, I mean, they'll just do it periodically. They do it for everyone. Um, you really want to paint them a picture. <clears throat> and even if your your disability is, I don't know what to say. Let's say your disability is some sort of vision impairment, maybe blindness. You would think Social Security would know, okay, well, this person has to be driven to and from work. They're obviously not driving. You can't let you can't assume they're gonna know that. Even though that they have all his the disability records and they have all the medical stuff and everything else, you have to say that to them. I take him to work every day. We pick him up from work every day. He takes the bus, he, he, you know, with whatever the situation is, you have to um, make sure you tell them exactly all the support that are, is going in to him being able to work at Burger King. So next slide is um, supplemental security income. So this is also Social Security's uh, a Social Security program for a person with a disability. This is a low income, low resource program. It was originally designed for the elderly with no disability status. And the secondary group was adult and children with disabilities. But what we've seen in the past 20 years 20, 25 years, more people on the disability status are coming through SSI. This was kind of originally developed um, for, uh, you know, individuals that were retirement age, but didn't work and didn't pay in, maybe like housewives and things like that. Um, but 
it's key, it's low income, low resource. SSDI, they don't care how much money you have in the bank, how you live, who you're married to, all that kind of stuff, because SSDI, you worked and paid into the system. It's just like retirement benefits. SSI, they care about all that because you have to not only show the disability, you have to show the need for the disability payment. So this is why a lot of students under the age of 18 don't qualify for SSI because SSI looks at the parent's income when the child is under the age of 18. When the child turns 18, they're still living at home with you. You're still doing everything you do. They're still in school the whole nine yards but then they're no longer considered a child, they're considered an adult. So Social Security doesn't look at mom and dad's income or resources, they just look at the child's. So this is why we see a lot of kids at age 18 go on to the SSI roles. Some of the features of SSI, limited assets. Add application and always. Um, currently, the asset limit for SSI is $2,000. That's it. That An asset is any money that the SSI beneficiary can get their hands on. Checking savings account, stocks, bonds, uh, you know, e whatever kind, any kind of money you can cash in. Sometimes even... Um, life insurance policies that have a cash value. Those are all assets. Once again, you have to show the need. If you have money that you can access, you're not showing the need for SSI. I just talked to a young lady yesterday. She's in a uh, $7,000 overpayment for SSI because she was, she was uh, started her SSI and she had some bonds that she cashed in and she put those in her savings account. She didn't know she was over the asset limit. And unfortunately, Social Security didn't catch it for two years. So what happens is you're in a two year overpayment, meaning the assets were over the limit. So she shouldn't have got SSI for those two years. So for every $914 she got per month, she was not due she now owes that money back to Social Security. In that example, they did get her back on SSI, but now she's on a payment plan. So they're taking um, $91 out of her check each month to pay that off. They don't play around with this. Um, now, can you tell Social Security, well, hey, you should have caught this two years ago. I mean, you can always ask those types of things, but it's, you know, they're, they're tough to get those uh, eliminated. The federal benefit rate for SSI is $914 per month. So if you're on SSI, you're either going to get $914 or you might get a little bit less. You might get around $600. The reason there's a difference between that is you would not be eligible for the 914 if you don't pay your fair share of living expenses. So I see this happening a lot with students that uh, live with their parents. Mom and dad don't charge them rent. Then they're not going to get that 914. They're going to get the lower $600 amount. Some people are fine with that. They keep it that way, no problem. Um, other times, parents do start charging rent. And if you pay, if the child pays enough each month, then you they could raise you up to the full $914. In Pennsylvania, um, Department of Human Services provides a supplement, and that's $22.10. If you get lesser, if you get the lesser amount of the SSI, the 600 and some, they do bump you up a little bit on that 2210. You get a little bit more, but not very much. Joy, we have a quick question from Carrie. Um, Carrie asked. Does this apply to rent or room and board or both? Um, because rent has to be counted on as like income for your taxes. It uh, that's a question I get a lot from parents. Um, yes, I mean you the 
<laughs> How should I answer this? So you have to show Social Security that they are paying uh, a fair share of the uh, bills for the house, including mortgage, uh, rent, utilities, how that affects you as parents on your taxes. Um, that could be a different story. That's why some families do not opt for the larger amount. They keep it at the six hundred dollars. Um, but that would be case specific. But you, they, I mean, what how you calculate what the child should pay is you should gather up all your expenses for the month for your house, and then divide it by the number of people in your household that are over the age of eighteen. Whatever that amount is, is that. SSI beneficiaries fair share. That's what they should pay. If you do that calculation and you don't have many expenses and you're only at three, four hundred dollars, your, your child is not going to ever get up to the nine hundred and fourteen dollars because they're not showing the need. To get to get up to the nine hundred and fourteen dollars if they're living at home with parents, you their fair share of the expenses should be around seven or eight hundred dollars per month. And so does SSA like to see a contract, like a rental agreement, or is like, if, you know, their name was connected to like bills um, and they saw like direct deposits coming out of their bank account, would that be sufficient for SSA? Uh, they do not require a contract and you don't even have to put the bills in the kids' names. All you have to show is that when the SSI is deposited on the first of the month and you've stated that my son is going to pay $700, you take that $700 out of his bank account and put it in the family's account and then pay the, the um, monthly expenses. You need to keep track of this though, because if or it, when you are a representative payee for your son or daughter or for anyone, um, they're going to send you a, a form each year and you have to account for how you're spending their money. So if you're saying I'm putting $700 a month to the room and board expenses, you have to list that on the form as well and have proof that it was taken out of the bank account and put into another account. I mean, to get this set up in, originally, to get to the classification and getting the full amount of SSI, you're going to have to show um, proof of these expenses. Once again, some families choose to not go through all that. They don't want to give Social Security all that additional information, so they stay at the 600. Um, others choose to, and but you do you are required to provide that verification. Because once again, this SSI is is really a, a a benefit that's that should be spent all in one month, because you're showing you're getting it because of need. So. Once you get that deposit on the first, by the first of the following month, very small amounts of that SSI should still be around. You shouldn't be really able to save a lot of money on SSI because if you do, and Social Security is going to say, well, do they need this SSI? And that's really that's really the key point with all this because a lot of families look at this and and the child is disabled significantly and and but it's a two-prong approach. You have to show that the disability, but then once you finish that, you have to show the need. Here in Pennsylvania, if you get SSI, you automatically get Medicaid. So probably if your son or daughter was, uh, were not eligible for SSI under the age of 18 because of mom and dad's income, they got Medicaid through the loophole protection in Pennsylvania. So what will happen is once you get them on SSI and they're eligible, they'll still keep the same Medicaid, but they switch to a different category of Medicaid. They get out of that loophole category and they move to the SSI category. Doesn't change anything. Um, there's a lot of different categories of medical assistance in Pennsylvania. It's just a matter of which one do you fall into. But the changeover between the loophole and the SSI, none of the benefits change whatsoever. I'm going to pause for a minute there because I went through a lot of information. Any questions on that?
hopefully I haven't overwhelmed anyone, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. So then whenever you're on SSI and you want to go to work, it's like, okay, now what do I do? This is a graph that I use in all my presentations, and it basically shows you how you're going to have more money coming into you if you're on SSI, even though you're working. The first column is the person's not working, but they're just receiving the SSI, the $914. Second column, they go to work. They're working and making $900 a month. Their SSI is going to be reduced because they're not in, in as much need of the SSI because now they have paychecks coming in. These calculations are all based on earning the $914, not the lower amount, but the same principle is, is for either. So the rule of thumb with SSI is the first $85 you gross every month does not count against your SSI. But then after that, for every $2 you earn, they take $1 away. So we're not going to sit here and do math calculations, but this is how it lays out. So if the person's earning $900 from their job, they're still going to get an SSI benefit of $507. So if you add those two numbers together, $1,407 coming in, they're still making more money than they were just on the SSI. And it just goes up the line. I mean, in column five there, the person's making $1,500 at their job per month, they're still going to get $207 in SSI. So that person's making $1,700. What happens with SSI is every month that the person works, you have to tell Social Security how much that person's making. That's how they do this calculation. And then Social Security sends you a letter saying, hey, we know Joy's working and making $200. Her new SSI amount is going to be $507. So it's, it's the responsibility of the rep payee or the beneficiary, if they don't have a rep payee, to tell Social Security how much they're earning per month. Even though you're working at Burger King and they're taking taxes out and everything else like that, it doesn't go through Social Security system quick enough. So it's the rep payee or the beneficiary's responsibility to, you can do it a variety of different ways, but the two most important ways or most, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The best ways to report is SSI has an app on smartphones. You can go on there and report your earnings. You can go online and do it at ssa.gov. Um, you can call the information in, or you can do the old standard of mailing in pay stubs to the local Social Security office. But yeah, I got to pick one of those ways and do it every month. If you don't, and a year later, Social Security figures out you were working, they're going to send you a letter saying, hey, we overpaid you because they were giving you the 914 every month, but maybe they should have only been giving you the 207 per month. So you've just accumulated an overpayment for 12 months um, and they're going to want that money back. If, if you have that money available and you want to just pay it off, you can. Um, if you've been working with Social Security and trying to get them to stop your check and you've been putting the money aside and you know all those types of things, you can pay them back. If you didn't realize this was going to happen, and now they send you this letter and they want you know $7,000 back, but you don't have $7,000, they'll put you on a payment plan, just like the case I discussed earlier. Um, so for X number of months, you're gonna owe back an additional, you know, so much money to repay that overpayment, plus the SSI is gonna be reduced based on your current earnings. Joy, we have another question uh, from Gretchen who said, okay. Um, did you say earlier that a disability diagnosis is needed by the age of 22? That's only for SSDI. That's not for SSI. And that's SSDI if you're a disabled youth or disabled adult who's that would be getting the benefits from your parents who've paid into SSDI. So for SSI, 
any disability anytime. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly right. And then same with SSDI. Um, but if you're going off of your own uh, benefits from your work history. If, if you're going off of the benefit or, or the SSDI on your work history, it's any disability, anytime. It's typically an older person, not older, you know, <laughs> you know, any, not a, not a student that gets SSDI because you have to, unless you're claiming off of a parent, because you have to pay enough in and kids couldn't have, doesn't, don't have that timeline to pay enough in. But, but SSI, I mean, it could be from birth to any point for the disability. Thank you. And then we have another question from Karen. Um, with direct deposit, are you able to just print out a pay slip and send it into SSA? Um, parent wanted a pay stub for which her son did not have because he has direct deposit. Or is that something he needs to request from his employer or from HR? So Social Security is always going to want to know gross earnings. So you can't use the deposit that's in the bank account because that's going to be net earnings. So he is going to need to request uh, pay stubs from his employer. And even though things are direct deposited, an employer has to give you a pay stub. They might give you an online account where you have to set up a username and password and you go in and print off those pay stubs. But you, you have to have access to pay stubs as an employee. It, it, it's It's... One of the tougher things, I mean, you would think it'd be easier because it's online. Um, a lot of a lot of parents and people just say to me, well, hey, they're online. Can I just email this into Social Security? Email, yeah. Social Security will not accept emails of pay stubs. So you got to get the pay stub. You either do it online, the app, call it in, but you got to get to that pay stub somehow because you need to show gross earnings. Okay, so yeah, Karen said that she had printed out the pay slip for this individual, uh, which has the gross payment and that has the entire information about the pay. So that should be sufficient for SSA, right? It should be, yeah. Um, is this a person's first pay stub that they have from the job or? Yes. Okay, so you want to always report earnings on a monthly basis. So if they got paid here early in July, you wanna wait until the uh, end of the month because they're probably gonna get another paycheck. Get that pay stub and then report all of July's earnings at one time into the local social security office. That makes sense. If you're going to mail them in, mail those pay stubs into local office, make sure you write your the beneficiary's full social security number on there because with identity theft now they don't put our full social security numbers on pay stubs and that's how they track us at social security is by our number so you have to just write it on the pay stub somewhere mm -hmm. if you're reporting in the app or online it's going to ask you for this uh, social security number and then you're going to input the uh, gross earnings if you if you can Social Security would like you to do things electronically as much as possible because it goes through the system quicker. Like if you go use the app or the online program, it's going to go in right away. If you're mailing these pay stubs or even dropping them off at the local Social Security office, someone there has to physically open up that envelope, put it in into the system, and it's it takes time to do all that. So if you can do, and it's easier for you too. It's, if you can do it electronically, that would be best. But some people can't do that. So then you got to go and, and mail them in. Mm -hmm. And how does it work if you call in? Do you just list off all of the earnings and the social security number like you do on the online, like the web application? Pretty much. Um, it's a special number. So you wouldn't actually call into the local office there is a special number that you call and it prompts you and you, you know, uh, use, uh, you know, the dial pad to key in your social security number, the amounts. So it's not, you're not going to really talk to a live person. It's okay. all prompted. That makes sense. And then we have another question from Jennifer who asked, is it true that clients are typically denied SSI during the first attempt requiring that they reapply? 
I mean, I, I hear that a lot from people. A lot of people think you get denied the first time. I don't think it's true. I've had people that get benefits on the first try. But I will say this, you make sure everything's documented well uh, whenever you're applying. So if anything is left not answered or you didn't send something in, I mean, that that decreases your chances of getting approved, but I have had a lot of individuals get approved on the first try. It can be um, difficult sometimes for SSA to get folks like medical records. I think especially any like mental health records. So you have to follow up with your providers to make sure that they're communicating with SSA and sending them that information because a lot of times they can't right? They can't even do like a full like review of your case if they don't have all the information they need. Correct. Correct. I always tell individuals with dealing with social security or county assistance office, be proactive. You know, if you're not hearing anything from someone, call, check on it. What do they need? Where are they at with the process? Because Yes, it, it, and even a slightest thing of sending the release to the, the provider and they, the pro provider doesn't respond. Um, Social Security is not going to keep, you know, requesting it. But your responsibility is to reach out to that provider and say, hey, Social Security is going to be reaching out to you. We're trying to get SSI for John or whomever. And then follow up with that provider. Hey, did you hear from Social Security? Did you send in the medical records? That's and key. certain medical records have additional protections that might require an actual signature, um, like in person. So that's something to think about too. Um, Joy, do you know the name of the Social Security app? Uh, I believe it's just SSI Reporting. I don't have a smartphone in front of me to look it up, but if you uh, go to the Google Play Store, try SSI Reporting. I'll look it up and I'll make sure it's from the right. It should be like from SSA or from mm -hmm. a government yeah. provider, but I'll look it up and I'll put that in the chat. Yeah, it's it's a very, I mean, the uh, the app, the picture on the app, you can tell it's a government app. It's not, There's nothing to it. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's gray, a little bit of blue and red. It's, uh, yeah. Nothing, uh, you know no branding on that or anything exciting. It looks like our questions have slowed down a bit. Okay. Thanks guys. <laughs> that, was a, that was a hot topic. That usually is. Um, yeah, so here's just this slide. I, I make one slide just for reporting. If you don't you know, take anything away from this presentation other than this, you've got to report these earnings. Um, even if it's minimal earnings, if uh, your son or daughter is making $100 a month, they still need to report this. Um, if your son or daughter works a few months and then they're off for a few months and then they go back to work, you've got to catch all this up. I talked to a mom the other day and her son um, has some significant issues. So he works when he can, but due to medical issues, he can't work all that, you know, for a few months and he goes back and the employer is very accommodating. And she said to me, well, all of last year, he only made $2,000. I said, okay. I said, but you still need to report all that because maybe one month he earned 500 and then the next month he didn't. So it's really important to keep them up to date on what the earnings are when he's not working. I mean, it's, you know, if, if, if he takes some time off for whatever reason, you have to let social security know that they're not going to know that they're, even though they have access to medical records, they're not checking on people to see if they're in the hospital or this or that. I mean, you, it's your responsibility to tell, tell them. Um, I always tell anyone that I work with, you know, if you, if you think about, well, should I tell Social Security? Tell them. It's better to have it on record than to not tell them. Um, changes in living situation. Your son or daughter live with you now, but they move into an apartment. You got to tell Social Security, not only about the change of address, but the um, uh, rental information now. Maybe it went up, maybe it went down. What's going on there? If they moved into a group home, Social Security needs to know about that. Um, all those types of things. Any types of changing in assets. If they get married, if they get divorced, what the, I mean, if they, I mean, they have children, all that stuff. They need to tell Social Security.
to talk a little bit about a, a form that we use uh, for everyone that we provide benefits counseling to. It's called a BPQY. And that stands for Benefits Planning Query. And this is basically a snapshot of the person's benefits. I'm going to show you an example here in a minute. But it's needed for individualized counseling because we need to verify what benefits the person's on. Um, sometimes people come to us and they think they're on SSI, but they're actually on SSDI. So if we go down the path of telling them about the trial work period and all this other stuff, and we should have told them about the SSI calculation, you know, we haven't helped anyone. So we need to have these for to verify benefits. This was developed specifically for benefits counseling. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's necessary. I can't say enough about it. It's a wealth of information. This is a sample of one. It may look like, uh, you know, Greek to you, but it tells us so, so much. I mean, it tells us what benefit they're on, how much they're getting per month, how long they've been getting it, um, you know, when their next medical review is. That's key too, because even though you're, you know, the person may have a significant disability that's going to be lifelong, maybe it's, you know, autism. You know, autism is, you know, if you have autism, it's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. But Social Security still needs to review that periodically for the beneficiary. They might not do it for every seven years or so, but they need to just double check to make sure, is this person still qualified as an SSDI or SSI beneficiary? Um, a lot of times people get offended by this because I mean like I said autism is not going away if you have an intellectual disability down syndrome whatever I mean those types of things but social security has to do provide that checks and balances um, also it's helpful because as we get older or you know we have other issues coming up in life maybe you have autism but then you've developed I don't know, epilepsy. This is just coming to my mind right now. So, you know, that would be when they do the work or the medical review, if you say, hey, now I have epilepsy along with the autism, they're going to add that to your record. So that would be a good thing. So they'd, they'd see the complete picture. Um, but it, it's, you have to do them. Um, you know, it's it's more paperwork, I get that. But if you don't do these required forms that Social Security is asking you for, you can become non-compliant. And if you become non-compliant, they can stop the checks just because you're not following through. So it might not make a lot of sense. You may not have time to do it, but, you know, you got to do it. Um, I know it forever sticks in my head about this one mom I had years and years ago and her son had Down syndrome and she was not happy she had this re medical review to do. And they're, they're like I said, they're time consuming. And she's like, I'm just going to take him down there and they can see he still has Down syndrome. And I, I said to her, I said, you know, I completely understand, but you have to fill out this paperwork. And she was not happy with what I told her, but, uh, and I don't even, I didn't work with her for very long after that. I don't know what happened, but, um, you know, it's just, it, it's, you know, it's not a good thing to have. We always want to talk about positivity and things that are going well and things like this. But whenever you do those medical reviews, you kind of have to lay it on the line and say, okay, this is, these are the net, these are what's going on. I don't want to say negative, but these are, you know, these are the things that uh, the person struggles with and kind of lay it out in black and white. But um, yeah, but we talk about that. Like in this example here, this person's me next medical review is seven years. So they put that at seven years because it's unlikely that it's going to be um, improved, but they still got to do them. The list on there about the representative payee talks about their health insurance, talks about have they used their trial work period? When did they use it? It's a super, super helpful report. Um, when we do counseling with families or beneficiaries, we go through this line by line with you. I mean, we make sure you understand what all this means and about the benefits. A lot of parents, um, families, and beneficiaries have said all oh, that. It's so helpful because it makes sense now, like what this is and what this means. Um, a lot of times people don't, don't get all that information. Joy, did you say that um, the medical review is always every seven years or there, is there some variation? 
Uh, no, it's not always seven years. It, it can be every year for some disabilities that are likely to improve. That would be if someone, let's say, it hurt their back at work. But with therapy and some, maybe a surgery, they're likely to improve and be able to go back. They'd be reviewed on a yearly basis. Um, yeah, and then there's some that are reviewed every three years every five years, and then every seven years. The three and five year ones are kind of the gray areas. Um, so it's not real likely that they're improve, gonna improve, but it possibly could. So that might be, um, you know, it's hard to say because there's all variations of every disability, but maybe, um, yeah, I don't even know if I wanna give an example because it, like maybe some sort of, uh, mental health issue that's recently diagnosed but with the thought of medication and therapy could improve but it's it, there it's there's so many gray areas that doesn't mean when you get that review that they're you're no longer eligible for benefits it just means they're reviewing your benefits that makes sense I mean, we've all heard stories in the news about, you know, Social Security pays benefits out to someone that's no longer disabled or some situations, some retirees that have passed away and they're still giving them benefit checks and the families are, you know, taking the money. I mean, they got to, they have to have checks and balances. And even if they did a medical review and for some strange reason they said your child with autism, it doesn't qualify anymore. You can always appeal that, you know, that's it's not, you know, you can appeal any decision that Social Security gives you, and you can take that the whole way up to an administrative law judge. You'd have to get an attorney involved, but you can take that the whole way up there to get your case looked at if you didn't agree with their decision. So how do you get a BPQY? You can call Social Security's national number. Um, you know, they are trying to work on the wait times for Social Security. So, you know, be prepared to be on hold, but they have been improving. Um, once you talk to a representative, let them know you want to uh, uh, get a copy of your BPQI, you have questions about working in your Social Security benefits, they mail you that out. So you get that in the mail and then um, it, is, it is free to the beneficiary. If a third party requests it, there is a fee from Social Security, but as the beneficiary or the rep payee, guardian, what have you, it, it would be free. But this is key for benefits counseling, that this be received. So I talked a little bit about funding and how I've been doing this for a long time. We're actually funded by the Social Security Administration under a grant called Work Incentive Planning and Assistance Program. The acronym is WIPA. Um, each WIPA provider has a certain territory that they cover in the United States. Here in Pennsylvania, there's actually four uh, providers. A HEAD, which I said covers most of Western Pennsylvania and into Central PA. We're up to about 36 counties. Appalachian Regional is actually out of West Virginia University, and they cover um, all the state, all the counties that border West Virginia. So, like Washington, Fayette, Greene, and up to Lawrence and uh, Beaver. Yeah. Um, and then we have uh, Disability Rights of PA. They cover the south, or I'm sorry, northeastern Pennsylvania. And then full circle covers the Philadelphia area. So we're all doing the same thing. We just different, have a different territory based on the uh, contract. All the work incentive coordinators that provide benefits counseling have to have and maintain a national certification. We have to go through uh, rigorous training because we're talking to individuals about very, very important issues, their cash benefits, their medical benefits. We got to know what we're talking about. And you have to feel confident in what you're talking about. And that only comes with uh, experience and education. So to be eligible for work incentive counseling, the beneficiary does have to be on social security benefits. So unfortunately, I can't help people apply for benefits. 
Um, they already have to be on Social Security benefits, but we work with anyone, um, I should say Social Security, meaning SSI or SSDI benefits. Um, they have to be age 14 up to full retirement age. Um, and individuals who have questions on working, uh, that's the uh, group of individuals we're, we're supposed to be talking to. And that's a ton of people, with that, with, even within those parameters. Um, we do focus on certain groups especially, um, and one of those is transition age. Um, Social Security puts a lot of efforts to informing transition age students and their families about work incentive, how it's possible to work when you're on benefits. Um, even if you know your son or daughter started getting SSI benefits last month, they can come to us this month for benefits counseling. That doesn't mean they're going to work right now, but you you need to know what's gonna what the plan is. Maybe, um, you know, your son or daughter is still going to stay in school till they're 21, but you want to know where, what, what happens with their benefits now that they're on benefits. And, and we talk to families about all these programs, about the assets, what that means, uh, you know, just to make sure that you understand the new benefits that your son or daughter might be on. We have a quick question from Jennifer. Um, is Harrisburg covered by AHEAD or Disability Rights PA or both? We cover Harrisburg AHEAD. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So like I said, we do prioritize transition age. We also prioritize people who are already working. Because, you know, if you're working and you're on SSI and you haven't reported your earnings yet, that's a problem. We got to get that in there and get that reported. Um, we also, the priority group is individuals who are real close to working. Like they've been on interviews, you know, they're, they're steps away from working. Um, also veterans. So if any of those uh, groups of people come through uh, under WIPA, they are going to be referred to the benefits counseling. The reason I state that is because you can call me, but the best way to get a referral into, um, I'm gonna skip through some of these, um, I'll go back to them, but the best way to get a referral in for work incentive planning and assistance is to call this helpline. And if you're in those priority categories, they're gonna ask you some questions to, to, you know, to see where you are in the priority. And then they're gonna say to you, would you like to be referred to a local contact, a WIPA, to go over your specific questions. You're gonna say yes. And then that's all you need to do. That's all the teacher needs to do, whomever, because then the helpline refers them directly to the provider in your county. So like the lady asked about Harrisburg. You live in Harrisburg, um, they would come, that would be a referral to a head. The helpline would send that information over to me. And we are required to reach out to you in a specified amount of days. Um, it's five business days from the date that you call the helpline. So we got to get to you quickly. Um, but what's nice about the helpline is they have access to some of Social Security's records. So they can give us some information on, you know, who's the rep payee, the type of benefit. So we can get the ball rolling pretty quick. Um, but this would be the best way to reach out uh, for a, a benefits counseling referral. Let's go back through here. I hit most of these high points. I get it. I'm, I've been meaning to change these around, but I haven't done it yet, the, the order of the slide. So when you call the helpline, there's going to be a customer service rep. You're not calling Social Security. You're calling a separate helpline. And they're just going to verify some information. Um, the beneficiary has to be on the call. Even if it's your son or daughter and you're their rep payee, your guardian, what have you, the beneficiary still needs to be on the call to basically say, talk to my mom or dad um, or whomever. And then the rep will identify the beneficiary's needs and provide some information, like I said, about, hey, do you want to reach out to a WIPA? Um, if when, when they come through to us, 
we technically have two business days to accept or reject the referral. I mean, we hardly ever reject anyone. The only reason we'd reject them is if we got the wrong, um, you know, they, they came to us and they were in the wrong county. Um, and then once I, I keep some referrals as the project director, but I also do distribute it to my team. And then we make contact within the first five business days. Another key aspect of this is we have a lot of referrals coming through. Um, so we make three attempts to contact you. If we don't hear back, we move on. Um, that doesn't mean if you're busy with life and you know you call us back a month later, we'll, we'll you know you won't have to call the helpline again. We'll still work with you. But after three attempts that we make, uh, we're you know that that's all that we can really do because we have a lot of referrals coming in. Um, we have another good question from Jennifer who asked, um, you know, when folks are on the line um, with the Ticket to Work helpline and how do they work with someone who's non-speaking um, to get that verbal permission? So make sure that if the person is non-verbal, whenever you're applying for social security benefits for them, that social security is aware they're non-verbal and they cannot state a, a verbal release. If that's the case and it's documented in the system, the Ticket to Work helpline will be able to pull that up and they won't need the verbal, but it has to be documented. Once again, even if it's something that you think Social Security should know, you have to have that documented with them. Otherwise, they will require a verbal release. That is a good question. This might be um, too imaginary, maybe not, who knows. Um, so let's say someone is new to like losing their speech, maybe because they, use, they have a trait or something like that. Um, would they then have to update SSA that yes. this is a new part of their disability to avoid any kinds of like verbal permissions required with ticket to work or other phone calls? Yes, you, you really do. I mean, it's important for the verbal releases, but really if anything is significant changes in your life, medical, personal, you should notify Social Security of that. And also the County Assistance Office because maybe there's other programs that you could qualify for. When in doubt, let them know. Do we have any more questions? I had a lot of great questions throughout. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, this is my last slide. So feel free to ask any questions you may have. I added a few resources to the chat. Um, the links to the Google Play Store and the App Store for the SSA mobile wage reporting app. Um, I also added a link so that folks can be updated by text or email if they want to, to be reminded to report their wages to SSA. Um, that's very cool. There's mm -hmm. a really um, thorough manual about the BPQI um, on the SSA website. So I also shared that with folks as well as our YouTube channel. Um, and I'll update everyone once all of the webinars. I know, I know some folks on this webinar have been at other ones, but not everybody's been able to make them all. So you'll all be updated once, um, once they're all uploaded online. And are there any other um, useful resources, Joy, that you tend to refer people to a lot? 
Um, if, if you go on to Social Security's website and look up something called the Red Book, that, that's a useful um, uh, document that helps you. It, it's all about work incentives. So it's really like the go-to manual if you have questions about working in your Social Security uh, benefits. So that's the Red Book. And there's also uh, another one called the Blue Book within Social Security. And that's designed to help with the application process. So if there are uh, individuals on here who are not yet applying for Social Security benefits and have questions on how that whole process works, the blue book is very helpful. That's awesome. And there's also a handbook for rep payees. And there's a bit of a difference if you're a rep payee, like a family rep payee for someone, if they live with you or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really clear and well-written handbook too. Mm -hmm. Social Security's documents have been improve greatly in the past few years. I mean, even their website, I mean, it, it's, there's a lot of useful information, um, you know, and for, and for uh, individuals who have not yet applied, if you want to apply for SSI or SSDI, you can do that all online now. Um, you can do the whole application online. You, you don't have to go into the local office, have a meeting, things like that. You can start the whole application. Now, they may reach out to you with some releases that you have to sign and all that kind of stuff, but you can do the whole application online. And it's it's nice because you can, you know, set it up with a username and password and do so much of it one day and then come back to it the next day. And, and you know, you don't have to sit there and, and feel overwhelmed by completing it all in one session. Mm -hmm. um, we got two related questions, one from Karen. Um, Karen works at Project Search, which is a project, I believe, with UPMC and Goodwill, maybe? Yes. Um, yes. Thanks. Yes. Um, for, so this is a training program for students with disabilities to prepare them to work at various jobs throughout the hospital system. And they have a hard time explaining to parents how it can actually be a good thing to not be on SSI because you don't need it. Um, parents tend to decrease hours instead of seeing that big picture um, of earning a decent wage with benefits. And then uh, we have another individual who's asked, any advice you can give when an individual wants to work more, but the parents don't want them to lose their SSI or SSDI? Mm -hmm. I like ABLE accounts, personally, um, especially for anyone who's developed their disability before 22. And... Um, I know that that age is going to be changing. It goes into effect in on January 1st, 2025. So that age limit is actually going to increase to, I believe, 46, mm -hmm. maybe 42. Yeah, um, 46. So folks who have acquired their disability before the age of 46 can have an ABLE account, which allows them to save long term. And that money is not considered um, when counting for things like Social Security and Medicaid. Um, special needs trusts are also useful for that. Um. Hmm. I mean, it's, we do run into it a lot with parents. I mean, uh, with or just anyone not wanting the Social Security benefits affected. I mean, I think education is key. Sometimes people don't realize how it's affected or the short term or long term goals. Um, ed education is key. I mean, PA ABLE accounts are, are very helpful. Um, you know, it does put that money aside uh, or does, I'm sorry, it doesn't count as an asset, but it's still, you know, if you're earning money, it's still going to count as earnings, even if you put that whole paycheck into PA ABLE. So, um, you know, the benefits counseling is still key. Um, but I mean, it's unfortunate. I've had some families that choose not to have their son or daughter work because that SSI is reduced. I mean, we try our best to encourage, but it's unfortunate. We have a few people here from Project Search. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, we also, for folks who um, maybe their parents are more worried about losing home and community-based services through those waiver programs, um, obviously one key piece of that is Medicaid eligibility. Um, you can be Medicaid eligible for home and community-based service waivers through medical assistance for workers with disabilities, which has a higher income and asset limit, if you are applying for MOD at the same time. Um, and that 
it's helpful. It allows for a little more flexibility. Mod, Mod is a great program. We talk to as many people as we can about that. And, and sometimes that is what needs to happen. Maybe because you do, uh, you know, the assets are too high or the income is too high for regular medical assistance. But you need medical assistance for waiver or just in general. And you can get onto the Mod program. I mean, the Mod income limit is it's higher than a lot of people think. And um, I mean, it's around $46,000 a year in earnings. It's, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's very helpful and, and to keep, secure those waiver funds and keep that because that's, you know, necessary. And, and their counting rules, like it's about 46,000 a year, but then, and they look at your gross income, but they cut that almost in half when they're counting. Um, so your actual earnings can be competitive. I mean, sure. It's pretty exciting. Um, mm -hmm. We have another question from Karen. Um, obviously, counseling is key, but so many families choose not to go to counseling. Have you experienced what kind of barriers have you experienced um, when working with families who are have maybe not bought in yet or are not convinced that you might have answers for them? <laughs> I mean, it, we we do talk to a lot of people that are very hesitant. They, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I've been, I was supposed to call you six months ago, but I just haven't done it yet. Um, you know, we, we try to be as accommodating as possible. I mean, I guess you're, you guys are going to hear more about the people that don't want to talk to us because if they don't want to talk to us, we're never, they're never going to get to us. Um, you know, and it, it's, it's different. I, I'm very familiar with Project Search at Goodwill because, you know, for years we used to go there, do outreach, you know, the referrals would come to us. So we, we had more of a collaborative um, relationship. But then when our social security grant changed, they... So security wants all of our referrals to come through the helpline. So that's some of the things that have changed. I mean, I'm still able to do outreach to groups like this. I mean, I could do something virtually with the parents um, through Project Search, um, through other entities as well to just tell them that, hey, this is, this is a service. It's free to you. It's for your information. It's the goal is to, you know, give you information, encourage, uh, you know, a better life for your son or daughter but really there's no you know, there's it doesn't mean that you have to go to work today or tomorrow um but yeah it's it's we still do run into uh, individuals that and and then sometimes well what happens is that we get the referral months later after the overpayments already occurred because they didn't they didn't want to seek out the benefits counseling for one reason or another and now they're really not happy because now they have this overpayment and they didn't realize they were going to have one. Do you have any advice for families who are just completely overwhelmed by this process? The application process? Yes. I, I think you, you, Sorry, as that was it, my question. That was my question. It's just the whole process, the whole process with even, even families who are well educated could be in the in the financial places wherever they need i actually have a family member who does receive this it's just overwhelming to a lot of them let alone people who um just are in that that wheelhouse um just has accepted the ssi and just went with it but hasn't really kept up on it you and i worked with a client earlier this year where mom didn't follow up and i know you know who i'm talking about she just didn't follow up she remembered you from 10 years ago mm -hmm. um and said and you, yeah you don't remember me joy uh, well you didn't do, you didn't do anything <laughs> you know 10 years passed mm -hmm. and so this young lady actually i don't they haven't received anything about returning money but we are watching the um the pay slips now but again i'm not even sure if she's even even in the right place I mean, I don't know if mom knows about SSDI or SSI. I really don't know because they don't know. They, 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 somebody gave them this money and they just run with it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, you know, I think in support staff encouraging them to follow up with things. I mean, our services are long term. I mean, I've worked with some people on and off for 20 years, um, you know, and it's not like a, 
like I talked to a lady yesterday and I was, she's like, oh, I have to ask you every question I can think of right now. And I said, well, you can ask me questions, but I mean, it's not a one and done phone call. I mean, I'm going to be here, you know, uh, for questions. So I think sometimes people think of benefits counselors as kind of like the social security office. Like if you get a live person there, you better, you know, ask them everything you possibly can because you're never going to get a live person again. So, you know, we are here to to help individuals and kind of walk them through. And, you know, some families I never hear back from. Maybe they got all their information or whatever, but some, a lot of families, a lot of beneficiaries, I, you know, they, they frequently call me, um, you know, and they're like, oh, you're still there. You know, we, we had, it, everything was going good, but when we got this letter from Social Security, I mean, it, it's not a perfect system. I mean, Social Security does realize that that people are afraid to go into the offices, ask these questions. So that's why they have benefits counselors that are supposed to be more accommodating, you know, talking to people on an ongoing basis. If we need to talk to mom for an hour, um, you know, we do that. Um, but it's 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 overwhelming. I mean, I get it completely. It's It's a lot from start to finish. And I agree um, with that. I'm just saying we we are working with another family who um, is really on target with what she wants for her daughter. Um, and she did go into, I'm not where, she, I don't know where she went to, but uh, the benefits counselor scared the heck out of her for whatever reason. I'm going to reach out to her and I'm going to tell her about this YouTube and see if that's something that can help her. Because uh, I know this mother has really tried her best to stay on top of things. But... Um, you know, like you say, you don't hear anything, you know, for years and years, and all of a sudden you get that letter. So well, uh, I think this could be beneficial to her. Yeah. And I mean, you know, if if the benefits counselor maybe wasn't a good fit for mom, I would tell mom to contact the project director for that benefits counseling program and say, hey, I don't think I, for whatever reason, I didn't mesh with her for, and, mm -hmm. you know, can we switch to another benefits counselor? I mean, I've had those calls from individuals. And I usually I take them at that point instead of switch them to another benefits counselor. But maybe, you know, they came across wrong. She having a bad day. I don't know. But, you know, I wouldn't just throw up your hands and say, well, you know, this is the end of it. You got to kind of plug through and, you know, and there, there are, I mean, you can go through the benefits counseling sponsored by Social Security, but OVR also offers benefits counseling. Um, so if the person has an OVR counselor, they can um, do a fee for service, a purchase order for benefits counseling. Um, Office of Developmental Programs has a benefits counseling program. So maybe other providers she can reach out to that maybe would be a better fit. Well, I don't know if it was the counselor so much as the information that was given to mm. her that overwhelmed her, that she thought she, you know, again, this was a mom that thought she had it all sewn up uh but then she just went on and it, it that's what she said she said it really scared me so she stopped so i am going to reach out to her again and i'm going to tell her about this this youtube video and my notes that i took and hopefully that will help her get her back on track and, and that's really what it takes is support staff like you guys to be there con you know not constantly but there to reassure and to just bring it up again say hey you know what let's try it again maybe it'll be different this time and i mean sometimes the delivery is is a lot i mean you know we you have some new counselors that come on board with this and they have all this information they kind of just throw it at families i probably yes. did it today and it's mm -hmm. like families are like what <laughs> like you you think mm -hmm. you, and and you know the way it's structured now too I, I'm a firm believer in you can't, you know, have more than an hour meeting with a, with a family because mm -hmm. your head starts to spin. It's too much information. It's, you know, and, and sometimes I know I've heard from other providers, you know, they meet with families for two, two and a half hours. I think that's way too much. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone gets anything out of that. I mean, I would look at it if I went to my financial advisor and I sat there for two and a half hours with him. I don't know what I'd, what I'd come walk away with. I think right. you have to do it. And, and we've had those accommodations too. Some some people only want a half an hour meeting. So we break it up over four meetings. Right. That it's almost like you have to give them a to-do a, a to do list, yeah. you know, yeah. a small to-do list. Say, go and do this and come on back. Yeah. Yeah. You can't throw everything at a person because they're, they're not going to know what to do. Right. I agree. It, and even if it's a situation where they do have an overpayment letter and mm -hmm. they're stuck there, 
it, it's you have to do certain things like with a to-do list to get the to make sure you're in compliance with social security but i mean you don't have to do this stuff overnight you have mm-hmm. some time to think through it you may need to file a waiver and things like that and you you are with certain amount of time with that, but you can always ask for an extension with social security, mm-hmm. but you got to know, okay, I can call and ask for an extension because da, 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 da is going on and they'll work with you on that, but you just have to tell them, you just can't decide on your own. Oh, uh, I'm going to do this, you know, next month when I have some more time. Right. And the one that we worked with in January, it was mm-hmm. that that's exactly what it was. So I, every month I meet with this young lady and she mm-hmm. said, I said, okay, did your mom do blah, blah, blah. Well, mom's mm-hmm. had both sets of teeth pulled, you know, upper and lower. Mom now works nights. Mm-hmm. And again, yeah. you know, what I'm going to say to her is if something comes up and you have to pay for this, what you've told me are not excuses. You've mm-hmm. got to get ahead of the game. And I think what I'm going to take back from this is that none of them should be sitting back waiting for Social Security or ahead or achieve it to come to you. They right. need to be proactive and they're not. Uh, so many of our guys uh, you know, families are not proactive with this. And I yeah, think that's a huge problem. Yeah, it, it is. It really is. I mean, you can't just, you know, put your head in the sand and say, okay, they'll get, they'll get to me when they get to me. I yes. mean, if you're in a situation where, you know, you're in an overpayment and you're putting that money aside years ago, I had a guy, he knew he was an overpayment, but they kept sending him checks. So he, he, this, when interest rates were good too, he put the money into like a small, a small uh, IRA or not an IRA, but like some sort of a bond. And then when so he made interest on the money he was saving, mm-hmm. he, he was at the CI. And so he didn't, it didn't matter about his assets, but then social security, it was a couple of years later, they finally did reach out to him and said, Hey, we overpaid you. And he's like, okay, here you go. And he t- dropped the check off and he made some extra money. Mm-hmm. Those are <laughs> few and far between. But you, you can't just sit there and think, well, you know, maybe I had one lady tell me, like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe Joy was wrong and they're going to give me the full SSI benefit, you know. And I mean, it it is what it is. You got to accept it and and move forward. But you, you have to be proactive with Social Security because, you know, those offices are overwhelmed. They're short staff, all that stuff. You know, even you're not their highest priority. They're They're going through the batch as they go through it. But mm-hmm. if you're calling and sending your stuff in and saying, hey, da, 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 then you move up to, the, you know, your, your file goes to the top of the chart. Right. I have one more question. So how can we find out? Because we've now opened up in that subject at Project Search. So how can we find out if they are SSI or SSDI? I mean, because sometimes the parents don't know, don't remember. You at Project Search, how you would find that out? Right. If we say to the kid, to these trainees, now employees, um, they don't know if they're SSI or SSDI. The only way you're going to find out is if you call Social Security with the with the client on the phone and ask those questions. OK. Or get their BPQI. OK. So it's not um, if they've made an account on Social Security, it's not wouldn't be it wouldn't be tagged like that. It could be but not in all situations. Okay. Okay. You might get some information out of there, mm-hmm. but you're not going to get as much as you need. Okay. Okay. That was great information. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you guys. Um, I think this is a good time to start wrapping up. I know um, I, I feel like we're all touching on this like theme of like, it feels like I know from family's perspective, it feels like this process of like hurrying up and waiting Mm -hmm. and because you're not seeing all of the stuff that's happening in the background. Um, But I think that's a very helpful note to, you know, remind folks to just be proactive, you know, communicate early and often with benefits counselors, with SSA, with service and supports coordinators, if you have them already. If not, if you might need them, give me a call. I'll let you know what we can do to get you where you need to go. But um, we have one quick, one last question here, uh, or two last questions. So Carrie had a question about funding. Um, Is benefits counseling only free after WIPA is exhausted? But I think you mentioned a few different funding sources. So there's WIPA through SSA, there's OVR, they have a fee-for-service model, the Office of Developmental Programs, folks enrolled in those waivers, that's also a fee-for-service model. And then the long-term living waivers also cover benefits counseling. 
but they might all be working with different networks of benefits counselors. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else I can say to that, but yeah, that, those, those are the ones that are available now. There is some uh, confusion because with the ODP and the Office of Long-Term Living, they can only be funded if WIPA funding is, has a waiting list. And WIPA cannot have a waiting list. Per our contract with Social Security, we have to keep referrals coming in and moving. So we do not have a waiting list. Um, so what it would happen is Office of Long-Term Living or ODP, if you chose not to go with a WIPA, you would have to seek funding through those entities. Okay, that makes sense. And then Jennifer asked a question, um, can a county case manager help assist with this process? Their role is more with um, the Office of Income Maintenance and like Medicaid um, and SNAP, those types of programs, um, which are state administered. Um, even though they're federally funded, they're state administered, but Social Security is federally administered. So they, you kind of have to go directly through them. Correct. Yeah, they, they could counsel you on what happens to SNAP benefits if you're working in those types of things, but not to Social Security benefits. Yeah, I think they would generally refer you to SSA. Mm -hmm. um, did that did that answer everybody's questions? I think Jennifer and Carrie were the last folks who asked questions. All right, great. 